I'm saying here in the background is climate chaos. It affects everything that the Nature Conservancy is trying to accomplish everywhere on the globe. Um, and uh, here in the American Southwest, just in general, we anticipate uh, warmer temperatures uh, overall in decades to come, and we anticipate uh, less precipitation. Uh, and so what that means essentially uh, is that uh, we're going to have more evaporative loss, we're going to have less of a snowpack, and it means that when we're lucky enough to get a snowpack, chances are we're going to lose it more often to a warm spring rain event. And so ironically, even though there's less water in the system overall, we could have more catastrophic energy along these river corridors on a more regular basis. Over 80% of all vertebrate species diversity in the southwest utilize these forest communities for all or part of their life cycle, and that's pretty astounding. But the question before us now is, do they have a future? Should we be uh, continuing to put our scarce conservation dollars into freshwater systems in the southwest? Or should they be going, say, to the central and southern short grass prairies, which have been identified as globally important grassland ecosystems on the eastern margins of the state? Or do we keep this precarious balance between the two? One of the most important things about the Gila uh, is that it's undammed. And so what it affords our researchers is an opportunity to acquire baseline information on how these systems are supposed to function. We often forget how important that is. If you don't have any baseline information, how do you even know what your target is or what you're shooting for? Most people working on river systems have the opposite problem of what we do here. Here, we're trying desperately to protect the natural hydrology. At other rivers across the West, people are taking highly altered streams and trying to you know, manage dams and other uh, plumbing along the rivers to produce what they call ecological flows, mimics of those flows that we come to understand to be ecologically important. And the way that we come to understand those flows to be ecologically important is by looking at river systems with their flows intact. And there's not a whole lot of those around uh, to do that with. The other great example of the importance of a baseline uh, area is just, you know, the, the Gila is rather famous as the uh, birthplace of Eldo Leopold's conservation ethic. And Eldo Leopold began his work down here as a, as a forest ranger right when the forest was created in 1909. He had worked here, I don't know, maybe a decade or so. Very traditionally uh, trained forester, you know, controlling the predators and getting the cut out, as it were, uh, until he finally made a trip down to the Sierra Madre uh, in northern Mexico, which at that time was still almost pristine. And it was like a two by four to the forehead for Errol Leopold. He saw healthy land for the first time and realized uh, with a shock that the landscape that he had been working with, and remember this is one of the best trained ecologists around, you know, with quite a, a famous ecological eye, he didn't recognize that the Gila was in such poor condition as it was until he saw healthy land. And then he realized, oh my gosh, you know, and it helped uh, uh, cement in his mind a radically new uh, way to view our situation. soil. That has taken on, I think, increased importance uh, recently. You know, it's never a good thing. And the same story has played out over and over again, you know, throughout human history. Uh, we've, uh, we've degraded uh, arid and semi-arid landscapes and lost a lot of soil uh, repeatedly through time. Water flows downhill, but erosion flows uphill. It's a process that we call dendritic erosion. Think of Niagara Falls marching its way upstream right now up the Niagara River. Uh, the water falls down, scours out a little hole, and the bank just keeps collapsing in among it, upon itself. And so it just rushes upstream. And what that means, essentially, uh, is that most of the erosion that we see ongoing uh, in the southwest today is not so much related to current management and use of the land, although that plays a part, but more importantly, it's the landscape coming into equilibrium. think about the western landscape as a pile of sand. 
uh, sitting there at the angle of repose. And right around 1904, we put our hands into the bottom of the pile in this region and pulled out a big hunk of sand. What happens to that pile? It just goes down into a new equilibrium. And that's what's happening to the Western landscape today. The energy inherent in the flowing water coming off of all these slopes is too great. And so by the time it gets down into the arroyo, uh, you've already lost the battle. There are lots of wonderful ways, you know, if you have endless time and resources, uh, to treat both things at once. Again, the larger goal is to make sure your upland landscape overall is becoming more spongy through time. But it's important to realize that the problem is above us uh, here. By the time the water gets down to this point, it already has too much energy because of the degradation of the national forest lands uh, uphill from us. We've been experiencing over thousands of years an extremely stable climatic episode, an interglacial, uh, that we call the Holocene. And most geophysicists around the world are starting to say that that's it. It's ending. Uh, and as a result of climate change. And uh, the way that we are going to be approaching our work as a conservation community is going to have to change right along with it. Perhaps by 2100, 80% of the globe's surface could be governed by what we call no analog ecosystems. These new climates are going to be governing brand new ecosystems that are comprised of uh, brand new species assemblages. And these species assemblages, uh, you know, in large part will be comprised of generalist species. Uh, specialists don't have a real bright future uh, under much of, uh, of our climate scenarios. Um, you know, it's going to be the 21st century is going to be hard on almost all living things, perhaps uh, excluding bacterial life. Um, and uh, what that means essentially is that even the words that the Nature Conservancy and other groups have used to define their work over the past half century, words like uh, native, uh, non-native, natural community, those words are losing their meaning. Uh, and we're left uh, sort of in a chaotic period where we're scrambling to try to understand how even to approach our work uh, under a, a world that's uh, changing uh, from the Holocene into something new. Um, on this property, for instance, you know, I've sort of painted a picture of what's happened here over the past century. Uh, but a conservation biologist can no longer stand here where I'm standing now and look at this property and tell you with any certainty what sorts of plants or animals may exist here 200 years into the future. But what they can tell you with almost certainty is that nothing much will exist here unless there's soil. Uh, so what it means is that you have to change your focus a little bit and start focusing on those ecological processes that confer to ecosystems the most resilience. Uh, the ability to make it through tough times, uh, unscathed, at least as unscathed as possible, and to come out the other side of the ecological bottleneck of the 21st century with as much potential uh, as possible as they move into the future. Mm -hmm.